Carry on. What? Okay. You recorded me as well. Oh, God. Yep. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, and stewards, now he's just arrived on time. Um, yeah, tonight man. we've got a, a bit of a talk. I wanted to tell you guys how they actually can invade your dreams and hijack your dreams and how it can Ooh, actually hurt your body, you know. <laughs> what? I have no what's idea. The... I think we got aliens. <laughs> or oh, Galaxy Tab S2 is trying to come yeah. in as well. Right, tonight we've got a gentleman who writes period, uh, quite often for Practical Wireless. I think every month I read it. It's very interesting. Named Tim Kirby, down in South Wales. He's a GW4 Victor X-Ray Echo. And tonight he's going to give us a talk on further adventures in on VHF. I've got it on the other page, yeah? Yeah, further adventures on VHF. So, if it's anything like the magazine... Uh, Writing should be very interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Simon sort out the the letting him in because if I do it, everything will disappear, and I'm not very good on that thing. So Simon, if you could um, yep. sort out the screens and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, gentlemen and ladies, could you mute yourselves while Tim is giving the lecture? There's nothing worse than somebody giving a lecture and somebody sneezing and coughing and doing other things while he's doing it, yeah? Thanks a lot. Okay, so, um, yeah, it's all set to share, Tim. So, you should be fine. Brilliant. Okay. Marvellous. Thank you. Well, not so far, Val. Um, it's lovely to be with you. Um, I'm afraid if it was left to my Welsh, the, um, the talk would be quite short, so uh, you'll, you'll have to excuse it uh, being in English, but it's lovely to be with you. Um, so this evening's talk is entitled um, Further Adventures with your VHF UHF station, and um, I'm hoping that I can share my screen. Uh, let's just probably just made a mistake. Let's see. Go over here. There we go. Right, share my screen. And if we're lucky, we'll get the right screen. So let's see. Let's try that. Let's see. No. Is that the right one? It looks Looks like it is. Good. You'll excuse me trying that out quickly, but after the, uh, the scare where I thought I'd lost my, uh, my notes uh, just before the, um, uh, the meeting started, I just wanted to check it was the right one, but we're good to go. So um, the talk this evening, Further Adventures with your VHF UHF station, it's, um, it's sort of built to follow on a, a Tonight at Eight presentation that I was asked to do for the RSGB uh, probably about 18 months ago, which is, was a, a real introduction to, to VHF UHF. Um, and I really enjoyed doing that. And um, what I thought it would be fun to do with, with this talk is to talk about some practical things that perhaps you might not have thought about trying with your um, with kit that you already have for VHF, UHF, you know. So one of the things I've, I've, I've sort of tried to think about different bits of equipment that you might have and, and things that you can try that, um, that might be interesting and that, that might, um, might make you think a, a little bit differently about VHF, UHF. So um, I think, you know, lots of us use VHF, UHF for, for local chats. Perhaps you have a club net, I don't know, but I'm sure you do. Um, and uh, local repeater QSOs and so on. And of course it's brilliant for that. Um, and, um, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps you do uh, listen to uh, where you are. I guess uh, there's lots of SOTA activity on, uh, on VHF, UHF. From, uh, from the mountains. Um, but what we'll do uh, this evening is, is look at some things which I think might perhaps extend the range of, of your VHF, UHF station and, um, and, and, and try and get more out of, uh, of gear that you've got. And I definitely want to try and convince you not to listen to the people that say, 
and there's no activity on VHF, UHF. I was, um, I was over in Cheltenham uh, last, uh, last week, uh, which is, is where I, I come from originally. My mum still lives there. And uh, there was this chap over there who's a lovely guy. Um, and and he, was, uh, he was moaning about how, how little activity that was on, on the, uh, the local repeater. And actually it was funny because I'd been round at a friend's house the, uh, the previous afternoon and it had actually been really busy. And uh, this dear old chap was saying, oh, there's no activity. So there's loads of activity, um, but it just might not be where you, you think it is. Um, so it might not all be on FM. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. So then, uh, I thought we would start uh, with a little bit about six meters, um, which is uh, which is a band that certainly interests me a lot, um, and uh, I think it can be uh, it can be quite rewarding uh, for uh, for people with with even quite simple stations, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So the the main um, sporadic E season is is coming up, as as you probably know, um, on six meters the the season largely starts in, in early May, although we're, we're starting to see one or two openings already in, uh, in April, and generally runs until about early August, but um, you know, there's some, some flexibility about that. Uh, something that, um, that not everybody uh, is aware of is that there's also a winter sporadic key season as well, which runs from December to January, I was, uh, I gave this talk a few times uh, last year and I was really sort of talking up the, uh, the winter six metre sporadic heat season and it was really poor this last winter so uh, that was, uh, that was peculiar. I think I, I barely noticed um, an, an opening on, uh, on six metres but you do quite often get uh, openings from around Christmas time into the, the first week of, of January. Uh, it will, 10 metres will often open via sporadic key, six metres. And if you're very, very lucky, perhaps four metres and two metres as well. I think just after we moved here in um, December 2019, uh, I did actually catch, we, we were just setting up here. I didn't have any proper aerials up. And um, I think I'd just thrown a simple vertical up. It's, in fact, it was one of these inflatable verticals. I don't know if you've, you've seen them, but um, they've got a, got a wire inside them and it's sort of a bit like inflating a life jacket. And you blow this thing up and hang it on a pole and so on. And I had that sat outside and I thought, well, I can make some local QSOs with it. And um, I was uh, monitoring uh, two meters and uh, believe it or not, I actually worked a uh, Polish station on this uh, thing with, uh, uh, with about 50 watts into uh, into the antenna so that was uh, so that was really good so you do get some sporadic heat in uh, in the in the winter but it's uh, it's pretty pretty rare something that's quite interesting um to to give you an idea of when six meter openings are going to start is is the 10 meter band if you've got a cb receiver in in your your shack as well you know lots of people sometimes look a bit worried when i talk about that but the the, the thing is that cb is very very well used in uh, in europe and it's uh, it's a great propagation indicator particularly on on the cpt band and um, so if you start to get lots of uh, very very strong signals from france and germany on uh, on CB, then that probably implies that the MUF is uh, is is going up pretty rapidly. Um, I think from from where you are, you 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 would hear French stations. You might even hear on on the UK CB band. Um, on uh, you might hear some uh, stations from the south of England. So when when the skip gets that short, it the the MUF is uh, is rising quite quickly, and of course ten meters will uh, will give you the same sort of clues. The the only reason I don't talk about ten meters so much in that regard is that it's it's not quite so well used, not so intensively used. So um, so that's a, a good clue. Something else that's uh, that's interesting at the moment. Um, I don't know if you've seen, but the uh, the Irish PTT. Uh, allocated uh, 40 and 60 megs, just a few uh, kilohertz of uh, 40 and 60 megs uh, last year. And there's some people starting to do some experiments on there. 
Um, Ofcom have said there there's, there's no chance of, of getting us getting a, a, even a small allocation um, for, for radio amateurs on, on those frequencies. But uh, interestingly, um, some people have, uh, have talked to Ofcom and have got a, a special sort of test license to that's uh, that's allowed them to. Uh, um, experiment a little on, on, on 40 megs. That's nothing to do with the amateur radio service at all. I think it's an innovation and, and test license. Anyway, it, it turns out that uh, 40 megs is, uh, is very interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's producing some quite interesting F2 paths um, down to uh, South Africa. Uh, but it's also uh, providing a very good uh, indication of, of sporadic E as well. So you, you might enjoy listening. I think it's around 40.675, 40.680 if you've got a, um, a, a, a receiver that will uh, tune around there. A lot of the, the general coverage uh, radios these days will, uh, will do that. And um, you know, people have heard the South African beacon. I think it's said S6WAB. Um, well, with, with nothing more than a 40 meter dipole. So don't worry if you haven't got a proper aerial for it, it's, uh, it's well worth a go. Anyway, we, we di digress. Um, what else gives you uh, an indication about uh, sporadic key? Well, the G7 IZU website is, uh, is very good, pulls a lot of data from, uh, from DX clusters and uh, PSK reports this and plots it on the map so you can get an idea of where the, uh, the, the sporadic key reflecting layer is and uh, watch that moving around. Uh, another site which is uh, really interesting is PropQuest, which is, um, is the brainchild of, of Jim Bacon, G3YLA, who, uh, who knows more about sporadic key than, uh, <laughs> than almost anyone on the planet, I think. Um, but um, Jim's got this uh, really neat uh, a website called PropQuest, which um, which tells you an awful lot about propagation anyway. If you're interested in HF propagation, perhaps you might enjoy looking there. It gives you an idea of what the MUF will be. But it's uh, it's very, very handy indeed for uh, uh, for looking at, at sporadic E. So great um, graphical clues, if you like, for, uh, for what's going on with propagation. And uh, something else, you know, I've mentioned CB, which has probably got me, lost me some brownie points and I might be back to lose some more. Um, digital modes give you a, a great advantage, I think. Uh, you know, lots of people say, oh, I don't like FT8 and, and so on. And I, I get that. Um, but they do give you a, a huge advantage in, in terms of, uh, of propagation. You know, a very, very weak digital signal will... Um, will go a, an awful lot, a lot further, if you like, than, uh, than even a CW signal. You know, I've always been a keen CW operator, but um, you know, for, uh, for sort of really marginal paths on, uh, on VHF, uh, digital modes are uh, a, a real advantage. So um, I really suggest you, uh, you, you have a look at those and, and try them out. And I know there's a lot of activity from, uh, from your part of the world on, uh, on digital modes on, uh, on six meters and two meters. Um, which is uh, which is always nice to see. Um, although I, I wanted to talk mostly about uh, six meters, it, it's worth saying that um, that other bands, uh, four meters and two meters, uh, are uh, are subject to uh, to sporadic E. Although uh, you have openings much less frequently than you you will on on six meters. Four meters opens quite often. Um, two meters is uh, is a lot a lot more touch and go. It always used to be. Um, people used to reckon that uh, the first week in, in June was the, uh, the peak uh, season for two metres sporadic key. I, I, I think um, experience tells us it's, it can be earlier that, than that and it can be, uh, can be later than that. I've known some good ease openings at the end of April, believe it or not, as, as well as into July. So um, you know, it just, it just depends what's, uh, what's going on. Interestingly, you know, there's, there's lots of good news about... Uh, uh, solar conditions improving and, and so on and those of you that are interested in in working dx on uh, on say 10 meters or 15 meters perhaps you'll be delighted to see the uh, solar flux going up and and so on there's um, there's a substantial amount of evidence that that suggests that sporadic e in solar maximum is uh, is much poorer i'm not sure we we really know why that is but um, but that does seem to be uh, seem to be a thing so we may uh, we may find that sporadic e is, is not quite so good over the uh, over the next little while. 
but you know it, it's um, it's it's not all bad news because uh, the with increasing sunspots, uh, we're starting to see some uh, some very interesting openings on uh, on six meters, uh, both transequatorial propagation and, and pure F two. Uh, in fact, I was I was lucky enough the uh, the other other day, uh, it's about two or three weeks ago, I. Um, uh, I, I popped up to the shack to see if anything was uh, was happening on six meters, and, and to my great surprise, I could uh, I could see some South Americans coming through on uh, on six meter FT8, um, and and the the real surprise is that I've only got a vertical up at the moment. I, I live in quite a exposed coastal location, so I tend to take the six meter beam down over the uh, over the winter. And uh, I have a vertical up, which uh, does six meters, two meters, and seventy sems, and uh, it works uh, works okay for those bands. But uh, it's uh, it's not a real DX antenna. But anyway, I was really excited to be able to uh, to work into South America with uh, I think about hundred watts to uh, to to that antenna uh, via a transequatorial propagation the other night. So you know that's something that uh, we wouldn't see. In, uh, in a sunspot minimum. And of, of course, you know, the, the pure F2 paths may not be too far away. It's gonna be worth looking this uh, this autumn, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll start to see some, uh, some pure F2 paths, probably north, south, uh, into Africa, into, uh, into South America to start with. And uh, then as things come up, you know, we'll, we'll start to see sort of more east-west type, uh, type propagation. So there we are, a little bit about uh, six meters. Um, you know, sim simple gear will work very well for single hop sprouter key uh, uh, around Europe, maybe into the States. What do I mean by, by simple gear? Dipoles, verticals, that sort of thing um, will, uh, will, will, will go quite well. And of course, many, uh, many HF rigs these days have, will, uh, will produce 100 watts or so on, uh, on six meters as well. So um, you can uh, you can have a lot of fun with uh, with, with simple gear. I think uh, a good mate of mine, um, Steve PJ4DX, out in uh, in Bonaire. Uh, he's uh, he's he's been having some fun on six meters. And in fact, just the other day, he worked into uh, VK and ZL. Would you believe on his forty meter dipole? Um, now that really is a uh, you know being in the right place at the right time. So, <laughs> but if you um, if you've got a, you know, you can tune a 40 meter dipole up or, or pretty much anything, I guess, in the sporadic key season. And uh, if signals are really strong, you'll, you'll definitely work people. Um, during the, the summer, you'll also start to see multi-hop um, sporadic key openings to, to the US, um, to the east and west coast, uh, to the, the Middle East, um, a6, A4, those, those sorts of guys will, uh, will be on um, Saudi Arabia as well. Very occasionally there's some, some openings into Australia, be interesting to, to see what happens this year. Um, some of the really good propagation on, on six metres tends to happen around the summer solstice, which is generally the 20th, 21st of June. And uh, we get what we call short path summer solstice propagation. Uh, and that, uh, that often provides some, some paths um, from here in the mornings into Japan and in the afternoons from here to the, the west coast of, uh, of the US, maybe Canada, uh, the west coast of Canada, V7 as well. So uh, some, some interesting possibilities is there around the, uh, around the solstice. Um, something else to, to look out for in, uh, in August, uh, there's uh, the Perseids meteor shower. Uh, meteor scatter on, on six meters is, um, is very good. Um, if, if any of you have ever played uh, meteor scatter on, on two meters, you'll know that the reflections tend to be uh, quite short. But on six meters, they're, they're a, a lot longer. Um, uh, they're, they're slightly weaker, uh, but you perhaps haven't got so much aerial gain and, and so on, but uh, the, the reflections are quite a lot longer. So that, um, that can be quite interesting to, uh, to play Meteor Scatter. And there's some, uh, some great digital modes available uh, for, uh, for playing with uh, Meteor Scatter these days. When I first started playing on VHF with uh, Meteor Scatter, it was uh, a question of sending high-speed CW with a, a memory keyer and cranking up the, uh, cranking up the speed and, and you'd, you'd try and, uh, you had a tape recorder and you'd, you'd 
listen for two and a half minutes or some uh, five minutes actually at uh, one stage and you'd be running your tape recorder and when you got a, a meteor burst you'd slow it down with this cassette tape recorder and um, and, and find out what you got but it's uh, it's a lot easier now with uh, with a computer um, so uh, so that's quite good fun. Um, there's a, a new uh, digital mode which is, has come into the WSJT uh, suite um, uh, called Q65. And Q65 looks really interesting for exploiting very, very weak signals, even, even weaker than, uh, than FT8, weaker than JT65A. Um, so uh, I, I understand that um, some of the uh, tests that have been done from, from South America into to um, New Zealand and Australia over the uh, over the winter period were uh, were running Q65 and, and that proved quite successful in, in sporadic E because signals are re really big you won't need to uh, to look at Q65 but it's um, it's worth getting familiar I think with uh, with that mode if you're if you're interested in uh, in, in weak signal type stuff. All right, so let's uh, let's move on to uh, two meters and seventy cents. I, I suppose you know many of us have got uh, FM equipment for, for two meters and seventy cents, and uh, perhaps we use it in, in for, for talking across uh, the town or uh, maybe twenty or thirty miles. But um, wouldn't it be fun to uh, to, to use um, our gear like that and um, you know, find out a little bit more about um, VHF, UHF propagation. Well, that's certainly something that we can do. So if you've got a, a two meter rig or a dual band, two meter 70 cents rig, and perhaps a, a vertical antenna outside, um, if, if you haven't got an antenna outside and you've got one in the loft, you know, I, I know how it goes sometimes, um, you, you can uh, you still be in business. And uh, what I, I suggest to people is that, um, that you program in all the, uh, all the repeater and simplex channels into your rig. It might, might take you a morning or something like that. Um, or you can perhaps do it via the computer and do it a little bit quicker. But, um, you know, programming all the different uh, channels um, that uh, that you see in the band plan and as I've said on the slide there actually the the channels which uh, are the most interesting are, are the ones that are, are normally quiet you know where you can't hear anything if uh, if you've got an s9 repeater that that's there all the time you're probably not going to hear a great deal um, through that but the, um, the 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 really interesting thing tends to happen when uh, when you've got uh, a quiet channel, and we'll talk about that in a second. In, in a second, but you know, I, because you've got the sea around you, you should see some some really op interesting openings. I think up and down the Irish Sea, I would expect for you to be able to to hear. Um, stations up on the west coast of Scotland really easily, um, as well as down to the Irish Sea in, in this direction, and probably down into uh, into Cornwall, maybe France, maybe uh, maybe Spain. I don't know, but you get some uh, some tremendous sea ducting at, uh, from time to time. Um, and uh, and the, there's no uh, no reason why that won't that's not just the preserve of things like CWSSB and uh, and FT8 so uh, you can uh, you can spot that on on FM so you know when you're in the shack you've got all your your uh, your channels uh, programmed up put the the rig on uh, on scan and uh, and see what happens and and you'll probably start to notice that. Um, particularly over the sea that you know just for a few minutes you'll you'll hear a, a signal pop up that you wouldn't normally hear and it's it's quite fun to to try and identify it and, and you know then the uh, the signals will go down again and uh, you know my uh, the, the example I, I always give of, of this is when I lived in uh, in Oxfordshire I was I was doing this sort of thing and uh, was uh, was scanning the uh, the, the two meter a repeater channels one uh, one afternoon and uh, it stopped on the channel where uh, where it was normally quiet and um, I, I heard a, a language which uh, which I didn't understand at all and um, you know I'm no uh, no expert linguist at all and uh, you know and um, I I thought, well, I don't know. I, I really don't recognise that. It's not. It's not French. It's not German. It's not uh, Dutch. It's not Belgian. So uh, I, I just kept listening, and um, I was very relieved when, uh, about sort of ten minutes later, it sent a CWID, and it was a repeater in Norway, in uh, in southwest Norway, 
and uh, I was I was amazed by that. And, you know, I think it was S nine. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was quite strong. So um, I, uh, I sort of went down onto uh, SSB. There was no digital modes at the time. Uh, tried uh, calling on one four four three hundred towards uh, Norway and tried to call on CW as well, with uh, with no luck at all. And uh, came back to FM and the uh, the signal was still there and it was uh, it stayed there for about twenty minutes. And this um, this repeater, I think, was in the uh, the southwest corner of Norway. I suspect it was uh, it was in a, a fairly well um, elevated site, and there was presumably just some sort of tropo duct across the uh, the, the North Sea. So. Um, that was uh, that was one opening that uh, really stick, sticks in my mind. But I also remember having some some nice FM QSOs with a, a repeater um, down in the uh, in the Pyrenees in uh, in France. And, you know, lots of people say, "Well, you know, repeater DX, so what?" Well, I was still making uh, making a decent QSO from uh, from where I was um, to uh, to a hilltop site in the Pyrenees. So um, so I was quite happy with that. So um, you know, do uh, do you try and, and scan the uh, the channels, and it's uh, it's amazing what you, you might hear. And you might also notice aircraft scatter, and and I, I wonder if you've um, if you've noticed uh, perhaps because you've got quite a few aircraft uh, flying over the top of you um, to. Uh, well, or close to you at least to uh, towards Ireland and some uh, transatlantic traffic, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, you may notice a sort of slight flutter on, on FM signals from, uh, from time to time and, and signals will just come up for a second. So you may notice that on, on FM. But I did want to talk a little bit more about um, aircraft scatter in, in general. It's, um, it's a very viable way of making contacts on, on VHF, UHF on, on six metres and above. Obviously, you know, the higher you go in frequency, um, the more reflecting area there is on an aircraft in, in terms of, of wavelengths. So, uh, but, it, you know, a 747 or an A380 or whatever is uh, still a decent reflecting surface on, uh, on six metres or four metres. And even on 10 metres, you know, I've seen aircraft reflections on, uh, on, on both CB and uh, 10 metre FM as well. Um, but if you uh, if you start playing around on, on two meter FT8 um, with, uh, with something like a vertical antenna, which I'll talk a little bit about in in a minute, you might start to see a display um, looking a little bit like like that. And I, you know, it hasn't happened in the uh, the last year or so. So I guess people are starting to get to get used to this sort of stuff. But um, when we, we first started playing with FT8, I used to get screenshots like this and you know, somebody would would say, "Oh, you know, what a dreadful signal this is!" And you know, my my neighbour or or this guy 50, 50 miles away is uh, producing a dreadful signal, which looks like this. And I'd look at the the trace and I'd say, "Well, no, actually, it's fine. It's aircraft scatter." And and perhaps I can sort of interpret it a little bit for you. Um, but you can you can see there's a hopefully you can see my uh, my mouse pointer. But uh, there's a, there's a signal there. Uh, which is uh, is going to be a tropo signal, but you can see that there's a uh, a signal that's going across like that, a sort of diagonal line, and that's actually a reflection from an aircraft of of that signal, um, and the, the the reason that it's it's moving in frequency o over time is of course Doppler shift. Um, you're you're used to if you hear a um, a siren or some or an aircraft or something like that you know you, you 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 hear the the pitch coming up as as it comes towards you and then uh, then it it falls away and that's exactly what we uh, we see on a on a on on that aircraft scatter in fact you can you know there's a there's a big trace there there's one aircraft you can just see there's a secondary trace there a little bit weaker um, that's uh, that's another aircraft, so um, so it can be uh, quite interesting. So yeah, if you see uh, see a waterfall like that on uh, on FT8, it's uh, it's it's usually not somebody who's um, who's doing horrible things to, with uh, with their signal, but it's uh, it's an aircraft reflection. So um, 
with aircraft scatter typically signals peak up for a minute or so and and, and the, the reason that that happens is that if I'm trying to uh, to have a contact with I don't know GM zero HBK up in the uh, up in the Western Isles, um, I'll be uh, beaming towards him, um, and uh, he'll be beaming down here, and then a, a plane will will come along, hopefully halfway uh, between us, and just for a, for a minute or so, while while our antennas are, are both illuminating that that plane we will be able to, uh, to bounce signals off the plane and, and complete a, a QSO. And if any of you are interested in the RSGB's VHF, UHF, uh, uh, yeah, VHF, UHF um, activity contests, um, the ON4KST uh, chat server was used to coordinate contacts using aircraft scatter and, and quite routinely uh, people in the south of England uh, will uh, will make QSOs into um, uh, into Scotland or Northern Ireland or, or something like that. So um, it's uh, it's it's quite interesting. And I think uh, you know, as you live quite close to lots of uh, aero activity, um, you should be able to have a lot of fun with that. And you know, maybe you use beam, but uh, even with a simple station with a, a vertical, you can uh, you can do some uh, some fun things. If you get interested in uh, in aircraft scatter, uh, have a look at the uh, the Air Scout um, software, uh, which is um, you can it's a free download. Uh, you can find it at uh, at airscout.eu, and uh, the way it works is that uh, you put in your location and um, you put in the, the target location of the station that you'd like to work or the beacon that you'd like to listen to. And um, it will uh, it'll plot a path. You can uh, kind of see that uh, from, from somewhere in Germany up into, uh, into Denmark. And um, it'll, it'll plot the path. You say what frequency you want to, uh, want to do it on. And so uh, you can see down here that it, it plots the uh, the path profile. So there's uh, there's a bit of mountain range in uh, probably in Germany at uh, at, at that uh, at that area. Um, but what the the clever thing that the uh, the software does is it pulls in uh, information from flight tracking systems like Flight Radar Twenty Four, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with from from looking at aircraft flying over you but it pulls in the data from uh, flight radar 24 and some other sources and and plots where the the aircraft are on, on the map and the moment that the uh, an aircraft comes into uh, uh, the sort of zone between you and your qso partner or the, the beacon that you're trying to listen to which is sort of in that area up there in the in the purple um, then you'll get an alert, and, and uh, hopefully, if you're 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 listening, you'll uh, you'll just see hear the signals come up for uh, for a few moments. It's really interesting. You can um, you can have a play with it uh, on, uh, on on two meters seventy sems for listening, or twenty three if you've got it for for listening to beacons or, or stations uh, in in Europe. Um, but it's quite interesting on four meters as well. You know, if you um, Particularly where you are, if you uh, if you point, have a have a four meter beam or a dipole, and uh, maybe have a listen for the, the Cornish beacon or a, a beacon back in uh, uh, back down in the home counties, um, you you will hear some uh, some quite good aircraft reflections from it. So um, so that can be really interesting, and it's. Um, you know, it's even if you just listen to beacons, it uh, it can be quite a fun thing to to sort of leave running in the shack, leave the uh, leave the software running, and um, see when uh, when you hear the beacon come out, uh, out of the noise and uh, and work out what uh, what flight it was. And it's quite interesting if you um, if you get involved in the the UK activity contests or, or um, trying to make uh, contacts, they, they actually say, oh, you know, this particular flight is coming into range in a minute. It's one of these aircraft and it should re reflect signals. So uh, it's, uh, I've never been on a flight that's been, <laughs> that I've known that's been uh, used for uh, making a contact. It'd be kind of fun, I think. All right, um, so that was a little bit about uh, aircraft scatter. I wanted to talk a little bit about VHF, UHF, FT8 with a very simple station. 
and you know, as I said at, at the beginning, you know, I appreciate a lot of people are, are not mad keen on, on FT8. Um, but, um, you know, please hear me out because there are some interesting possibilities. Um, and I, you know, if you've got a 50 watt dual band 2 meter 70 SEMS rig, which, which is capable of um, SSB, um, perhaps a, a vertical antenna. Well, you can you can work VHF, UHF, DX with that. You know, I know we we've been programmed over the years to um, to say that uh, if you want to work um, VHF, UHF, DX, you need a, a horizontal beam. Well, um, yeah, I'm not saying throw away your beam or anything like that. But uh, what I am saying is, if uh, if you don't have the ability to uh, to put something like that up, um, then uh, with uh, with one of these rigs. Kind of vertical antenna, you can uh, you can make some uh, some really interesting contacts, and it's amazing, you know, what you you learn about propagation. I'll tell you a, a little bit about my my experience doing this sort of thing in uh, in a moment. But I think I I learned more in two years playing around with this sort of stuff than I had in the uh, the previous sort of thirty years of uh, of playing around with uh, with VHF. So um, I really recommend it. The the PSK reporter website, which I'm I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, uh, just uh, just Google it if you haven't come across it. I can't, you know, I can't remember the URL, but uh, PSK Reporter, and, and um, you'll find it, and it uh, it shows where you've been heard on on FT8 or uh, the digital modes. Actually, even sometimes on CW, but believe it or not. Um, but uh, that's uh, that's really interesting. A, a good way of uh, finding out where you're you're being heard, and you know, once again, you're in a great location for for interesting propagation. What sort of uh, propagation might we see on on two meters seventy cents with this sort of gear? Well, tropo openings might be uh, a possibility. Both you know, extended openings. I would say, you know, the month of June or September or something like that, with a high pressure over uh, over the country. And um, you know it seems that the opening is is going to last forever, so you get the openings like that, and you get the very short openings, um, like the one I I talked about across the North Sea into uh, into Norway. And so you get those those sort of openings, which are, uh, are both very interesting. Aircraft scatter sporadically. We've we've talked a little bit about meteor scatter. We've talked a little bit about. You're probably going to struggle to to make meteor scatter contacts with. Um, with 50 watts on the vertical antenna, you almost certainly would do on six meters. On two meters, um, you'd be very lucky. Maybe in the peak of the Perseids, I, I guess I should try it sometime and, and see if I could uh, see if I could do it. But um, it, it's, you'd be pushing your luck. But you will see a lot of meteor reflections um, on uh, on receive. Uh, you just won't see them that that frequently. So um, what you, you'll sometimes see on if you if you're monitoring FT8, you'll suddenly see you know one period from from a DL or an OK or something like that at uh, at quite big signal strength. You know minus three, minus four, maybe even plus something. Um, and this is on a you know this is a vertical antenna. This is nothing uh, special. And you'll just see that for for one maybe two. Uh, periods of, of, of uh, 15 seconds and then that's uh, typically going to be uh, a meteor reflection so um, it can be quite interesting. Uh, you do need a little bit of a, a different mindset to uh, to operating on, on HF you know if you operate FT8 on uh, on HF you know but by and large the contacts go back and forth pretty quickly but on uh, on VHF it, it, it might be that uh, 50, uh, it takes 15 minutes to uh, complete with, uh, with a, a station under difficult con conditions, but um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's quite fun to, uh, to try and do that and, and make some, uh, some difficult QSOs. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, my, my sort of first introduction to, uh, to two meter FT8. I was, I was living in uh, Oxfordshire at the time and uh, FT8 was just starting to be used on, on VHF. And I was seeing some, some messages on Twitter about you know, people were working stuff on two meter FT8. And uh, my beam was broken at the time. I had a, one of these uh, little beams and I uh, accidentally fried it um, and it wasn't very easy to uh, to get the antenna down so um, I was just on on the uh, 
on the vertical at the time and I thought well you know maybe I can I can hear something on on FT8 if I just use a vertical and uh, sure enough I worked at a station that was uh, 20 30 miles away and that was uh, that was okay and then uh, one evening I thought well I'll, I'll try it out again because it wasn't that common for people to be operating on two meter FT8 at, at the time and I put something up on Twitter and I said you know I'm going on two meter FT8 144.174 if anybody wants to have a listen and you know, we can try and have a QSO and I was called by GW1 JFE who's, uh, who's a good friend he lives uh, down in Haverford West about uh, 15 miles from uh, from where I am now and uh, uh, Richard called me and we uh, we had a it, we exchanged signals and I was utterly amazed because I knew that Richard wasn't using a beam he was using a vertical antenna and uh, about uh, 50 watts or so and I knew that there was no way that we could have worked on on sideband or on, on CW so that was that was a very interesting QSO but what what was what was even more fascinating was that we I had so many QS probably over 200 QSOs with Richard I think um, and we, we tried sort of very many different days in different conditions and so on and it was um, it was very rare for us not to be able to to exchange signals um, you know sometimes in in a good tropo opening the uh, the signals were, were very strong plus five or something like that but more often they were you know down towards the um, the, the weekend of things you know minus 21 or something like that and, and at one level it was almost more interesting when we couldn't work and and then we'd start looking at the weather map and trying to work out what was happening and, and curiously what I discovered was that um there were times when it was raining over the, the, the mountains just to the west of Swansea or something like that. And although we could see each other's signals, um, there was some dispersion going on. So, um, so you couldn't actually decode um, the, uh, the signals. It was, I suppose it's a bit like an aurora or something like that. Um, so, uh, so that was uh, that was really interesting, and and some of you might be saying, well, you know, if, if signals were, were were that strong, why didn't you try working on SSB some of the time? Well, we did. I think there was um, there was an occasion when uh, conditions were really good, and uh, we were uh, swapping sort of plus five, plus four type reports with each other on FT8. So, uh, so we tried SSB. You know, remember this is, is 50 watts to uh, to a vertical and um, we could just hear each other on SSB not not enough to to have a, a proper QSO but there was you know you could you could just exchange call signs and, and perhaps reports but it, it would have been it would have been really challenging to do uh, much more than that um, and, and that was when conditions were really good so that gives you an idea of, of how weak some of the signals are that uh, that we're talking about here, so um, so that was uh, that was amazingly interesting, and I, we had a, a lot of fun with that. And we'd also see a lot of uh, you know transient openings. Um, I, I discovered you know I always think about tropo being with with quite settled, calm weather, but I've actually started to learn that there's quite often some good tropo. As if it's blowing a gale, which quite often is here, and I'm sure it's the same with, with, with you. Um, and it's it's interesting, you know, you get a, a weather front coming in off the Atlantic, and, and I would very often see uh, F6 APE, who's down in Western France, who would just pop up for a few minutes uh, as a front would, uh, would come in, would presumably cross us both and then he'd be gone as the uh, as the front cleared to uh, to the east of us so um, so you know that sort of thing was uh, was really very interesting that gives you an idea you know not to show off but it just gives you an idea of what was possible those those were um, the uh, some of the squares that I, I was able to work with this uh, little setup of uh, of a vertical antenna and uh, 50 watts. You know, I, I, sh I should say that, you know, where I was, it was on top of a small hill, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the uh, the most brilliant uh, VHF station, but, you know, you can see that the, uh, the signals um, uh, went, uh, went, went a fair way. And in fact, uh, went off that map as well. I, um, 
I think I did actually, but the, uh, the furthest I managed to work was, uh, was into Greece. And I'd I, was, I was so pleased because I'd never actually worked Greece on two metres before, you know, even with uh, 400 watts and a beam on, on sideband or CW. Um, but I managed to, uh, to, I think it was SV2JL, um, I worked uh, with, uh, with 50 watts to, uh, to a vertical. So it's, uh, it's surprising what, uh, what you can do. So uh, I'm not saying, you know, throw away your VHF, UHF beams at all. You know, uh, you, know we're, you live in a reasonably remote part of the country, uh, as do I. And I think it's you know, quite beneficial to have VHF, UHF beams. But it is interesting. I, I sometimes you know, just listen on a, on a vertical and I'll hear a completely different set of signals on, uh, on two meter FT8. Um, with uh, with the vertical aerial than I I will on uh, on a beam so uh, you know do uh, do have a think about having a go with it you know don't be put off by people that tell you you need stacked and bayed beams and, and things like that to to work uh, VHF DX you know that this uh, this sort of stuff does uh, does allow you to to do it with uh, much simpler gear um, you know be a good neighbour I've I've said here. Um, one of the things that um, that I think is very important is if, if one of your neighbours is uh, is also transmit, try and transmit in the same period. You know, it's it's a bit difficult to uh, pick out a really uh, really weak sort of signal if uh, if somebody just down the road is uh, uh, many dB over S nine. So uh, you know, try and transmit in the uh, in the same period if you can. By the way, I'm just looking out the window. Um, and look out across the sea from uh, from where we are and I can just see the uh, slightest hint of a, a temperature inversion out there so uh, maybe there's uh, maybe there's a bit of uh, VHF DX um, to uh, to work this evening so maybe I shouldn't uh, keep talking for too much longer. Um, 70 cents FT8 works as well it's uh, it's much harder work than uh, than two meters, I found, but um, you, you can have some uh, some some good QSOs using something like fifty watts to a vertical. Um, it's worth saying that there are now uh, some FT8 activity periods uh, each uh, each month uh, on uh, on two meters and seventy cents. Look up the FT8 activity.eu and it will a website and it will tell you uh, when the sessions are. And um, there is a, a 70 SEMS uh, FT8 activity period. And, um, you know, there's, there's a reasonable amount of activity. So, um, so it's worth trying, uh, trying that out and, and seeing who you can work. Um, some people are trying FT8 on their 12, 1296 megs. You know, one of the, the great things about the, uh, the ICOM IC9700, it does two meters, 70 SEMS, 23, as you probably know. So uh, if you've uh, if you've made your 9700 talk to the uh, computer on two meters, you can try 70 sems and, and 23 as well. Um, FT8 may or may not work brilliantly on uh, on 1296 megs because you start to get a bit more dispersion as uh, as you go up in uh, in frequency. But uh, some people are making Q QSOs, so uh, you know, well worth experimenting and and seeing uh, seeing what can be done. So um, there we go. Uh, so I think you know we talked about VHF UHF is uh, is really really good for for local chats. But hopefully I've given you some some ideas to look at uh, of things that you could uh, potentially try, perhaps with gear that you already have, um, and and make you uh, and help you look at VHF UHF in a different way, and, and perhaps you can get some more out of it. And I have talked a lot about digital modes, then they may not be everybody's cup of tea, but um, they do give you a huge advantage. And of course you can you can still use non-digital modes when you want to. I, I suppose I use digital modes on, on VHF, UHF, you know, 99% of the time. Um, apart from the odd FM QSO, you know, when I'm out and about. But um, you know I I, I quite in, on HF, you know, I tend to do quite the reverse. I tend not to use uh, digital modes very much on there at all. And far, far prefer playing uh, CW and, and so on. So I think you can mix and match these things uh, uh, quite well. And uh, I suppose the other thing I, I really wanted to, uh, to try and 
bring out this evening is that although it's always brilliant and fun to have fancy equipment and the latest and greatest rig, you don't actually need that to, to make some, some really interesting QSOs. Um, you know, a fairly, uh, fairly basic uh, rig and aerial can, uh, can actually get you quite a long way on, on VHF, UHF. So there we are. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope it was uh, I hope it was interesting to you. Um, I will uh, very gladly uh, listen for any questions that uh, that you may have. Um, but otherwise, I'll hope to see you on the air. Dio con far. Well, let's see if our um, Mr. Chairman is still about. Oh, she's about. <laughs> Do you want to stop the sh screen sharing now? I will, yes. If I go over. There we go. There we go. That should do the trick. Yep. Oh, well, yep. there we are. Right. Well, I enjoyed that. I've got quite a few notes down here, all written down here. Can have a look at. And uh, yes, I've certainly got the equipment to do most of it. Brilliant. The old 706, even though it's old fashioned, covered in dust and cobwebs and things like that, still works brilliantly on all sorts of things. So I may well have a crack at that once I've done a few other things, of course, but there we are. Have any of you gentlemen got any questions for Tim? Um, well, I, uh, I, just to your angle, so just lately, we've been seeing the Northern Lights. Um, have you any ideas or whatever? On, well, in the old days, of course, there was a lot of calling CQ Aurora. I didn't hear anybody even though the, normal, the Northern Lights were able to be seen. Um, have you ever experienced anything with that? Yeah, it's a, a really good question, Graham. It's funny, you know, I, as, as you may know, I write the, uh, the VHF column in, in Practical Wireless, and we don't seem to have had very many auroral um, reports in for, for the last few years. It's funny. Um, and I uh, just uh, this last month, I had, uh, had an email from, uh, from David, G4 DHF, who uh, I'm sure many of you know. And um, David was was telling me that um, there'd been some uh, some auroras uh, recently, and uh, he'd been on on the key on uh, on CW, and uh, had uh, had managed to to work some GMs and and some SMs, but I think you know the the conversation that David and I had at the time was that the the sort of old school modes like CW and, and sideband are probably a, a little bit better. Um, than, than certainly something like FT8, which would probably struggle with the um, with the Doppler shift. If um, if you haven't heard um, CW or sideband on uh, via Aurora, it uh, it goes to a very very raspy note on CW, so it'll say something like that. And actually, if you go on to seventy cents, the uh, the Doppler shift is uh, is even more crazy. Um, and on uh, on sideband, it sounds uh, a bit like. Whisper, CQ Aurora. It will sound like that. It, it, it's uh, it's really interesting. So the um, so I think a digital mode like FT8 probably wouldn't work. But some of the wider modes, um, I think JT9's got some some quite wide modes. They they might actually work. But actually, I think probably stick to CW and it work uh, work really well. So I think you know in in answer to your question. Um, we're seeing increasing solar activity again, um, so we should start to see uh, more auroras happening. And um, I, yeah, I, I reckon uh, you know keeping an eye on on those uh, those warning sites and hopping on CW um, when uh, or, or sideband uh, when there's a, a auroral opening is is probably the way to go. And uh, just one more thing about um, auroras: it, you, it's it's a while since uh, many of us have experienced them. And um, it's worth remembering that there's there's often a first phase and then it tends to go quiet. And then there's a second phase sort of later on in the, in, in the evening uh, when uh, when the signals can come back again. So uh, uh, that can be uh, that can be fun, too. So, yeah, thank you for asking about Aurora's brand. That's uh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for answering. Uh,
I'm afraid that uh, the AM days have gone, but that was the times that we were using the Aurora bands on the old AM. How oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. You see, That's I was about to... Sorry. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, that is. Back in yeah. the 70s. We only, we only had AM then. <laughs> yes. Truth be, truth be told, I like AM, actually. You know, I like all these fancy modes, but I quite like AM. <laughs> Yes, I think there's something to be said for it. Yeah. Right, so if, if Tim likes AM, I'll be um, in my, uh, my other hat from another club. I might be emailing Tim then. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that brings back memories to me. When I started, which was quite a while ago, uh, we, we used to have crystal control on two metres and AM. And uh, I had a, a Tom Withers communicator, right? And a halo on the car, you know. And uh, I, I can always remember when, because obviously you, you crystal control fixed frequency, uh, you, you always put out a call called and say, I am tuning from low to high or high to low, you see. And then people came on with BFOs, they spoiled everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they made yeah. the contact, I didn't. And I was the one putting mm. out the call, you know. That's right. Yeah. Rock band, as we used to call it. Yeah, rock band, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. This is um, something I've said before to people, but uh, Tim was talking about the, the single hop E's and things, and even on FM. And um, when I was living in Craven Arms, so John would know when I was in Craven Arms, I used to have a, at one point, a, an XPMR set on four metres FM. And I was living in this little tiny place and just two storey, but the attic was effectively the bedroom space, you know. So I had a commercial dipole I'd built made, just some rubbishy RG58, and it was just pinned vertically, just off the rafters in, in the room. And uh, to talk to a... Um, John would know uh, RHF Alan G7 oh, yeah. RHF just a few miles up the road. That was the only one really that was on four locally. And the one day it was just seriously bit monitoring, and I ended up talking to a guy in Sicily for about fifteen minutes mm. because the, it, we thought, well, this might be quite fleeting. So we did all the exchange of the details. Yeah, the five seven five. Well, there's one with an anytone. I think it's an anytone. Um, all the exchanges of the details thinking that, you know, it could go at any second. And once we got past that, we then spent the best part of 10 to 15 minutes talking about the weather and, you know, mm. you sent me all sorts of weird and wonderful, but it's just amazing what can be done. Yes, it's not digital, mm. I appreciate, but what with really inexpensive equipment, let's face it, coaxial dipole, the coax isn't rated for that, you know, you don't want it on VHF RG58, it's just cheap, nasty stuff I had to hand. And so God knows how inefficient it was. So at that 15 watts, I might have only had a couple of watts going out, but we still had enough with the magic of propagation yeah. to do something quite interesting. Mm. So, sorry, Tim. No, no, don't be sorry. I, yeah. I think, you know, those sorts of magic QSOs are exactly what it's all about. And uh, it's, yeah, I think uh, there's something particularly about fm and am you know when you've got this great stonking signal coming in from from somewhere um those those are really wonderful qso's so no that's that's brilliant anyway gents i'm gonna have to disappear this evening so i've got a couple of things to do but for my part tim thank you and i should leave you in the hands with everyone else it's great to see you simon and you tim <laughs> all right take care yeah oh, yeah, sorry no. it's quick. okay see you oh, yeah, yeah danny and liz um well, yeah. could you, Danny, could you give me a quick call when you're finished and stay on here? Because I need to have a quick word with you, but I've got to do something else. Oh. So Danny and Liz. But carry on. <laughs> yeah, OK. Carry on. Thanks, Tim. <laughs>